Spirit in the Bible. So we are going through the book of Colossians, and we're in chapter 3, the second part of it. Um, The last time, well, a couple times ago, we were in the paragraph starting in verse 18. Uh, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Today, we get husbands, well, I almost read it. It's just one verse today. But listen, listen to the word of the Lord to you this morning, and especially husbands. Let's read this. I'll briefly ask for the Lord to bless this time together, and we'll dive into it. Uh, It says this, Husbands, love your wives, and do not be harsh with them. Can I get an amen? There we go. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, please sow this into our hearts this morning. Help us to be... Like you are to us, faithful, true, loving, gentle. Lord, we need you this morning to transform us into your image. Amen. Amen. Uh, It actually works out this morning because Brooke is helping out in the nursery. Otherwise, I was going to say, Brooke, you're not allowed to look at me during this sermon because of how bad of a job I do of this. Um, But she's in there today serving. So... The Lord helps in that way. Uh, This sermon I'm preaching not out of a place of personal accomplishment, but just out of what's next in the text where the Lord would lead us. And he's been leading us through this uh, kind of incredible, compelling is the word I've used before, reordering or redoing of the whole world that begins in Christ and breaks outward. He has done it in the church He's done it in our hearts, and so we've looked at that, how the new self in Christ, he's done it in the church community of loving, forgiving. Uh, he is doing it in the, in the marriage. He's reordering and re-beautifying uh, the parent-child relationship. He's going to look at the workplace relationship. We're going to look at that in a little while. Uh, but this morning is the marriage relationship, and last time ago... We looked at the wives part, so and I promise that wives got it that day, husbands will get it today. And so it's a pretty simple uh, verse, and so we're just going to break it down into its parts. Husbands, love your wives, do not be harsh with them. Husbands, love your wives, don't be harsh with them. This is what it says to you this morning. And again, this is one of those places where it applies to all of God's people, but not all in the same way, Uh, and it's particularly focused on husbands. So this is for us today, for you, Um, but it applies to even if you're not a husband, and this is why. Um, Husbands, when you take this first word, this is actually something that I feel is a a given, it's a taken for granted, but it's actually not that helpful to leave it for granted in terms of what a husband is and does. Paul actually addresses husbands, and there's a lot he doesn't say about what husbands are and do, and especially as I was studying um, this, you know, the family in seminary, it was kind of one of those things where it's like when you're getting to know someone and you've forgotten their name, but it's way past the point where you should have forgotten their name, and now you're too embarrassed to ask their name, and so you're hoping that Someone else around them says that, or your wife, if you're with her, says that. Like you, you should know, and you think you know. It's Gary, probably, or it's John, or it's someone. But you're not totally sure, and it's helpful to actually say it out loud. So here in this passage, the role of husband is called upon. Husbands, love your wives, don't be harsh. But what is a husband? Like what is that? Uh, people have studied this, and there's a lot in the Bible that talks about it, but I just want to hit this as a whole, because he's going to say love, and he's going to say don't be harsh, but how, like what, what are we doing as we're loving and not being harsh? So what, is, what does a husband do? So uh, Timothy Whitmer is a pastor. He wrote a book uh, about shepherd leaders, and he then wrote a book applying that to husbands, and this is Uh, His thesis, which I think fits and holds, is all throughout Scripture, anyone in leadership is usually given uh, a title of shepherd. 
They're called shepherds. They're, they're put next to, and as an analogy or a metaphor, the shepherd one is placed on leadership. So in the Bible, kings, so actual government leaders, are called shepherds. So First Chronicles is an example of this. Let me read it to you. Uh, then all Israel gathered together to David and said, uh, Behold, in times past, even when Saul was king, it was you who led out and brought in Israel. And the Lord God said to you, You shall be shepherd of my people, and you shall be prince over my people Israel. So king compared to shepherd. Uh, the leaders of a church, those who lead not just the land government, but the church, are also given the analogy or the picture of shepherding. So 1 Peter is a classic example. So I exhort the elders among you, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. He does not, or the Bible does not, in an explicit way, say, husbands, shepherd your families, including your wives. But in that kind of gap or that blank, this is, what he, this is what the Bible does do. It uses all of the same terms that shepherds do, all of the doing verbs that are applied to leaders as shepherds, church leaders as shepherds, are applied to husbands, and we'll see that. But this is one helpful part for me. Uh, in 1 Timothy, where Paul is coaching this new leader to, to bring up elders in their church, this is what he says. These are the requirements of who would become a church leader he must manage his own household well. And that manage word is lead. It's rule. So in order for you to lead uh, a church, you must lead your family well. In order to lead and shepherd a church, you must shepherd your family well, is the blank that I would fill in. So I think it's an actually, it's a valid paradigm here. And, and I want to show you. So it's actually helpful to look at what husbands do, and Whitmer provides these helpful um, explanations and illustrations throughout. So the first that husbands are, do is lead. So that would be kind of the most basic. We've just said that whoever doesn't lead his own house well can't lead then the church. So a husband is one who leads, and we kind of see that in verse 18 right before this. Wives, submit. Like, that's the opposite of the submit word. That's the reciprocant, is lead. So if wives are to submit, husbands are to lead. Submit to the leadership. But it doesn't say that here. It assumes that you know that. Husbands love. Husbands don't be harsh. It doesn't say husbands lead. But it, it, it's assuming that husbands lead. And that's kind of a nebulous, you know, word here. How, what do, I, how do we actually lead? But listen to this picture, and it involves leading, and it involves shepherds, and see if you can start to begin to connect how someone in leadership of a family and a husband might lead. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me or causes me to lie down in green pastures. That's a good thing. He causes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul or refreshes my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So you begin to see a picture of leadership and husbands are those who lead their families and lead their wives and wives are called to receive that leadership there. But it helps to kind of flesh it out more. So husbands lead it's helpful to say it. It's like the name you know, but you forget. Husbands lead. Uh, the next aspect that a number of scholars have pointed out that husbands do is feed. And this is Timothy's, uh, yeah, Timothy Whitmer, the author. This is kind of his phrasing of it. Uh, but it's provide. Lead and provide or feed. And so you saw this just now in this psalm even. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He, he causes me to lie down in green pastures where I can eat. He provides. He leads me beside still waters where I can drink. He provides that. And he leads me in path of righteousness. He, he teaches me. He feeds me not just things but instructions 
as well that are for righteousness' sake. So he is leading and he is providing. And there's this interesting uh, passage in uh, the Bible that talks about requirements for those who would be supported, like widows of the church. And he says any widow who uh, has family members needs to be supported materially by her family members first. And he says those who don't support their only family members, provide for them, are worse than an unbeliever. So basically, like, you're, that's bad. That's bad. I don't know how else to say it. In Paul's eyes, that is bad here. So there is a leading, but there's also a providing that husbands do. Again, not said. It says love. It says don't be harsh. But in the background is leading and providing for your family and for your wife. And so Whitmer identifies a couple of ways. Uh, traditionally, providing or making sure that there's actual you know, money there in the house, working hard. God put Adam in the garden, the original husband, to work, to work the land, it says, to keep it and to guard it. And so he works the land there. So ordinarily, husbands ought to work to provide for their families. That's a good thing. You lead me beside still waters, green pastures. But also spiritual provision as well. Uh, Adam was always meant to not just be a husband, but a, a priest. And so when Paul in Ephesians talks about husbands, he relates them to Christ and the church. And this is what he says that Christ might sanctify the church, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and blameless or without blemish. That's what he compares husbands' relationships to wives. And so there's a spiritual, and he notes a, a helpful quote by Jonathan Edwards. This is what Edwards says. Every family ought to be a little church, set apart to Christ, and wholly governed and influenced by Christ's rules. And the husband is the one who provides that, who leads in that. So there's material provision, there's spiritual provision. So lead, provide. Third, husband. When we look at husbands, what do husbands do? They protect. They protect. So this is in the psalm that continues through. This is what shepherds do as well. They protect. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. And your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So in Ephesians, Paul says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And then he says this, And gave himself up for her, Listen to Jesus Christ in the Gospel of John. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Do you see the parallels there? Husbands, love your wives and give yourselves up for her. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. So this original picture is that of David as a shepherd uh, when, when bears and, I don't know, Israeli cougars or mountain lions, I don't know what is there, comes to get them. He doesn't flee and leave. He stays, he fights, he protects for the sheep. And so husbands, when it says give yourself up for her, it means more than just protect her, but it at least means protect her. It is to protect to give up your life, lay it down to protect. So lead, provide, and protect. And so how to practically, how, what does that mean for husbands? There's phys physical protection, obvious. But then there's also even protecting your marriage that Whit Whitmer helpfully pulls out here, which means keeping yourself from lust and from adultery and from faithlessness, protecting your own marriage that way, and then guarding and defending lovingly your wife from being pursued outside of that marriage, of just uh, loving her and knowing her and knowing if anyone is trying to jump in on that and, and get in that relationship and break it up. I'm trying to be, like, I'm trying not to say the actual words here, just for little ears' sake. But 
Lead, provide, protect. And Whitmer applies one more that's even more in the background, which is helpful. It's to know, to know your wife. Shepherds know their sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. And originally, way back in Genesis, Adam, it says, Adam knew his wife. It means more than a, a, a mental knowing, but it doesn't mean less. And so Whitmer says, if you are to protect, if you are to lead, if you are to provide, you have to know the needs of your family and know the needs of your wife. So do you know? Do you uh, listen? Do you know what her strengths are? Do you know what her weaknesses are, her struggles? Do you pray? Do you lead? Do you know? So all of this is kind of baked into the background across the pages of Scripture. It's not here in this verse, but it is here when he says, Husbands, all of this is assumed throughout the pages of Scripture that the husbands know what they're doing with their wives. And so do you know? I'll, I'll pause there and say, do you, did you realize that? Did you forget the name husband and what it meant? Is it helpful to have it spelled out to you? Lead, provide, protect, and know here. So that's kind of first. If this verse says, husbands, love your wives, don't be harsh. This is what husbands mean. This is who it's talking to and what they're supposed to be doing. So that's the first point. The second, he goes on to this. Husbands, love your wives. This is the main command of this passage here. Husbands, love your wives. So we've already seen in this passage here what Paul is doing. Paul is kind of taking one of these main sin patterns that has messed up his world, and he is slowly writing them and fixing them. And he goes down, and he talks first about the self. We've covered that in previous sermons. The main kind of brokenness that we experience is to be led not first by Christ, but by our desires, our passions, uh, anger, lust, all of these things. And Christ gives us, he breaks that power, he sets us free, and he gives us the ability to begin obeying him and loving him. Then he goes down, and we've looked at this as well, to the compelling community, the church. And the main point of sin he talks about is division. Division because of differences, division because of offenses between one another. And that's what he addresses. And so when we read this passage, we say, what is one of the main temptations of a church or a group of Christians and he says division. And so that should be one of uh, the things that perks our ears up to be looking for. So what does he say when he gets to husbands and wives? Wives, we looked at, his main command as Christ begins to reorder families and lives and marriages is submit. And so we looked at kind of this independence um, streak. But for husbands, his main command is love. What does that say? about our main temptation as husbands. In Ephesians, Paul says this, Husbands should love their wives as their own body, for no one hated, no one ever hated his own flesh. No one ever hated his own flesh. So the opposite here of love is hating. And in the Ephesians passage, Paul actually spells it out. You don't hate your own flesh. You love your own flesh. And so he sets up this paradox. So how do we hate? How do husbands hate their wives? I'm sure there's ways that you might guess, but let me read this to you. In Mark chapter 10, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and they want to be leaders. They want to be first. This is what he says. He called them and said to, him, to them, you know that those who are considered, considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. They lord it over them. And you've probably heard that phrase, they lord it over them. What does that even mean? When you look at that word, lord it over them, this is the kind of primary definition that comes. To rule to one's own advantage. To rule, but to do it for your own good and your own benefit. And here in this passage, when he's saying husbands love, what he has in mind here is not just this general kind of Valentine's Day love command here. He's talking about a person in a position of authority, 
And we'll see by the third point here of not being harsh to them. This fits as well. Love, when he's saying husbands love, primarily what he's getting at here is not ruling to your own advantage and leading to your own advantage and providing to your own advantage in your marriage, but doing it for the other person. So this is how Jesus continues his teaching. But it shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. For husbands, to love is to lead, provide, protect for the sake of the other. And to not is to do it for one's self. So since we're in the theme of shepherding, I want to read you this passage that's helpful. Uh, Whitmer talks about it in his book, but it, it is this picture of a shepherd hating his sheep. Listen to what it says. Ezekiel 34. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, which is like the nicest portion. You clothe yourselves with the wool of the sheep. You slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. And this is what he says, listen. The weak you have not strengthened. The sick you have not healed. The injured you have not bound up. The strayed you have not brought back. The lost you have not sought. And with force and harshness you have ruled them. This is what Paul is talking about when he's talking about husbands loving. It's this self-centeredness that husbands are prone to in marriage. And so if, if I were to apply this passage of Ezekiel to husbands, it might say like this. Shepherd, husband, you use your wife for what she gives, but you do not feed her. You do not use your strength to strengthen her. You leave her wounds unattended. You do not seek her out. With force and harshness, you have ruled her. And so she felt lost, unsought, and unloved. Ezekiel continues, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds. I will require my sheep at their hand. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths. This is this does two things for us. First of all, this is an encouragement to any wives, my own included, who have not been loved as well as they should be. Second of all, this is a call for husbands, a, a role for the Lord to lead you into. Listen to this encouragement from the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep. And seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from the places they have been scattered. I will bring them out. I will feed them on the mountains. I will feed them with good pasture. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost. I will bring back the strayed. I will bind up the injured. I will strengthen the weak. This is what the Lord promises to do. Husbands, we can either be a part of that or against it. But when we're against it, we're not just against our wives, we're against the Lord who loves our wives, who shepherds them himself. Peter, in his moment of truth, uh, scattered. He left the flock. But Peter, uh, Paul, sorry, Jesus comes to Peter Uh, after his resurrection. And he sits with them, and this is what he says to him. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, 
Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And so he said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, John, son of, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said it a third time. And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And then he said, feed my sheep. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Husbands, love your wives. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that. Love your wives. It's more than that. Feed my sheep is more than that. But it's not less than that. Husbands, love your wives. Husbands, love your wives. The third part is this. Don't be harsh. That's, that and enough uh, says enough to my soul, not to be harsh. Um, but there are ways to lead and provide and protect. Uh, Whitmer tells this story of a group of tourists who are in Israel, and they're on a bus, and they're going uh, through the countryside, and they're looking. And the guide, you know, tells you about the different sites that you see, and he's talking about shepherds and opening up the Psalms. And I have a friend who went to Israel and did this, and the tour guide kind of showed him, talked about shepherds and how they lead. And so um, part of what this tour guide was saying is shepherds always lead from the front. Shepherds always lead from the front, and he was telling these people. And as they were driving by, uh, they see a flock going along the road, uh, with the shepherd walking behind them. And they say, look, you just told us the shepherds always go in front, not behind. And so it says, the story goes, he, he stopped the bus to step out and to have a word with the shepherd. As the guide got on board the bus again, he had a grin on his face and announced, that wasn't the shepherd, that was the butcher. <laughs> so, so there's ways, there's ways you can lead you can either, and the point Whitmer makes, helpfully, is you can either lead from the front or drive harshly from the back. And how you move the sheep matters. How you shepherd matters. It doesn't just matter that you provide, but it's how you provide. And Paul's big kind of uh, declaration to the church, even in this, which includes husbands, is that even if I have tongues and, lo- uh, and move mountains, if I have not love, I have Nothing. I accomplish nothing. And so Paul to the Thessalonians says, You know us, and we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. Love is patient and kind. It doesn't envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It is not irritable or resentful. The way we lead, the way we love matters because it is a picture ultimately, of the way God leads and the way God loves. We are either working with and manifesting that image, or we are effacing it, destroying it here. So Paul says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger be put away from you. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as Christ forgave you, as God in Christ forgave you. Husbands, often the way that we love is comes from the way that we have been loved, not always, but the way we loved often comes from the way we've been loved. Paul says, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So we've talked about that before, but that vertical relationship affects the horizontal. And so my call to you this morning is, husbands, love your wives and don't be harsh with them. To do that, My call to us, to you, is to look at, draw from, reflect upon the love, the gentle love of the Lord towards you. He is not harsh with your mistakes. Oftentimes we hear in our heads, how could you? Or you did it again, you buffoon, or something like that from the Lord. Uh, Listen to the Lord and how he shepherds you. And from that place... Begin to love and shepherd your families, and especially your wives, well. This is a rewriting of Psalm 23. It's by Eugene Peterson, but it applies to you. God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. Husbands, you can say this to Christ. You 
have given me a place to lay in lush meadows, and you find me quiet pools to drink from. When the world is all around and work is overwhelming, you let me catch my breath, and you lead me in the right direction. When the world is out of your control and insecure, even when the way goes through Death Valley, I'm not afraid when you walk at my side. Your trusty shepherd's crook makes me feel secure. For providing, when you're called to provide upon, you serve me a six-course dinner, Lord, right in front of my enemies. You revive my drooping head. My cup brims with blessing. What husband here does not need to be revived in their drooping head as they lead their families? This is how he ends it. Your beauty and love chase after me. That is the truth, husbands. God's beauty and love chases after you every day of my life. I'm back home in the house of God for the rest of my life. This is our call this morning. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Lord, we ask that you would do these things that we talk about. Don't let them be just words to us, Lord. Father, as a husband, we confess to you the ways that we have not lived up to your leadership that you've made us to. Lord, we're sorry. Father, I pray that you would lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. That you would strengthen every husband in this place. That you would strengthen every husband to be in this place. That you would strengthen the families and wives and women that are around us, that you would help us to show your love as it truly is. Thank you, Lord Jesus, our shepherd. Amen. Let's respond in song, asking for the Lord's help uh, as he works this in us. Would you stand as we sing this?